All righty, here we go, huh? 10.15, that means it's time to start. Let me set my timer so I'm sure to keep us here on time. I don't know how long this is going to take. I put this together based on the book that we're going to use, but I didn't time the presentation. So we'll see. Wait, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do edit. Turn that off. Well, that'll be good enough. Okay, we're almost closed. So as we uh, gather together, is there anything you were hoping that I would share in these series of forums? Anything that you really wanted to tackle, like uh, who you should vote for, or <laughs> anything? Arguing with grandchildren. All right. Grandchildren. All right. How do I talk about political things as a priest? All right, I can do that. I have a slide, which will be kind of funny for us to look at. How does Edward handle it? All right. Anything else you're dying for to, to hear about or discuss? All right. Well, let's get going. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a book, and I'll talk more about this as our, our, our resource, our tool. And you are more than welcome to read it, but these forums are intended to be a one-off. So you can read the book or not read the book. It doesn't bother me, and it won't impact your participation too much. Um, I will say that the author is going to be here in January. So it's kind of fun when we have an author come in for you all to read his book and be able to talk about it. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. If you do want to follow along, I have a bookmark for you that tells you each Sunday and what we're going to talk about on those particular Sundays. And on the back of the book bookmark, just some prayers um, that I love especially as we think about um, division. Um, and um, one is for the whole human family and one is for the family. Um, so they're great uh, ways to sort of um, jog your prayer life and help um, push you and pull you in different directions that, that may not come to mind. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about the prayer book is that it's the prayers of the saints, not just what happens to come to our mind, but what has been um, through history part of our prayer life. So let's start with prayer for the whole human family. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so these are up here. Follow me if you want them. So uh, we're talking about learning to disagree over the next couple of Sundays. And um, just by way of introduction, for those of you who don't know, I'm uh, Edward Gleason. Um, many of you know me. Um, some of you have been in groups or forums with me. I've hopefully taught or facilitated a discussion or two. Um, and I think we'll hopefully over these coming weeks uh, learn together, uh, grow a little bit in the knowledge and love of the Lord, and enjoy being with one another as we find things to disagree about. So uh, we're doing new technology today, too. Um, this is actually pretty neat in the life of our church. So to, today you have two adult formation opportunities, both streaming or online. So it's one of the new upgrades we've had in our technology. Um, but I wanted to start with the basics. What is a Sunday form? So sometimes we have Sunday forms here at the church that are, that are a one-off. It may be like, uh, what is the program year ahead? Other times it's a series like we have today. Um, for us, um, we want to structure our time uh, as a drop-in as people arrive back for season. Um, so that's why we have a book, but I'm not, it's not required reading. Um, 
We'll start each Sunday as I get my cuff, cup of coffee and then get organized, and then we'll end about 11 o'clock so I can get organized for the 11.15 service. Um, so why learning to disagree? Um, why, why, why do we even have this uh, topic? Uh, well, um, last spring, um, Nicholas is sort of looking at the whole formation overview for our parish family, um, and we thought, well, with all the political differences um, that are uh, ripping us apart, it might be good for the church to offer time. Um, I'm mindful, too, how political differences are strain on clergy, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that, Anne, in a slide or two. Um, we're not trying to solve any problems today. We're simply observing that there's division, that people are disagreeing about many things, and it is good and holy to reflect on the world around us. How are we as Episcopalians um, called to be in moments and places of disagreement? Um, I've talked about our book as a resource, but we'll also have scripture, and we'll have the Book of Common Prayer um, our, our worship as ways to reflect on disagreement. Political divisions make me want to quit. So um, not me so much, but uh, a 2022 Barna poll cited current political divisions among the top three reasons why priests want to quit. Um, the political hurt felt in a number of churches not only stresses the ministers and leaders, it also sets bad examples for non-believers. Um, Pastor Eugene Cho, author of the book, Thou Shalt Not Be a Jerk, A Christian's Guide to Engaging in Politics, claims a big part of this problem is a lack of discipleship in the body of Christ. He says, we have to stop and regularly ask ourselves, how does our faith in Christ inform how we live our lives, including the engagement in politics? rather than how does our politics inform our discipleship. Cho said, does our faith in Christ, discipleship, inform our politics, or does our politics inform our faith? Um, so I can use this as an opportunity to talk about sort of um, how Edward Gleason um, looks at political differences. Um, and my number one um, priority, demand on myself really, is that when I see you in the hospital room, I don't want you to see a political, um, a political um, position coming into the room. Uh, my job is to be with you in um, the great times of joy and in the times of sadness, um, and I can do that as a prayerful person without telling you how to vote or without commenting on every single news article out there. That being said, I think that in the church, um, that there is place in our discussion and our dialogue as people for, uh, for a priest to guide um, and offer insight. Now that's unique, right? I'm not here as a Republican or a Democrat. I'm not here as a city council person or a senator. I'm a minister. Um, and so that means I've taken vows to take care of the young and old, rich and poor, everybody in between. Um, so how do I offer um, reflection um, from that sort of Christian Episcopalian view? Um, you've seen more often than not, it is through uh, pastoral messages that I send out by email. Um, I um, am careful about those. Um, I pray. I read the New York Times, and I read the Wall Street Journal. I look at MSNBC, and I look at Fox News, and I try and figure out what in the world is actually going on in this particular instance. Um, and then um, I reflect on what is it that our um, 2,000 years of Christian history, um, and also the reality of the Lord's Prayer, that the kingdom will come and his will will be done at some point. Um, sometimes, some days, I wish it was sooner rather than later. Um, but in the meantime, we're called to be faithful Christians and followers of Jesus. So that's how I, I, I handle it. Um, and different priests do different things. There are some um, churches that well, they really are on one side. They're either left or they're right, and you can tell that in almost every single sermon. Um, Trinity by the Cove is a diverse place. Um, we have right to left. We have uh, billionaires to food stamps and everything in between. 
So one of the things that's helped for us as a, a faith community is in our mission statement, we focus on being a loving and compassionate environment, right? So if someone comes into this church and they're not loving and compassionate, well, we need to have a discussion about that because we can all be here and disagree about some of the most important things in life and still love one another. At least I think so. Are we really that divided? So as I began thinking about our, um, our time together, I actually go do homework. And so I said, you know, what is it? Are, are, are we really as divided as I think all the headlines say uh, we are? And I had in my mind, you know, Thanksgiving. And when I saw on TV, every time Thanksgiving comes around, people say, oh, my gosh, we're going to have all of these family disagreements. It's going to be just terrible. Um, Thanksgiving is an awful time. And I, I was reflecting on my own experience, because I have that, and my Thanksgivings aren't really terrible. I mean, we watch football, we eat turkey, uh, we have a wonderful time telling jokes, you know, a great aunt might sit on her plate of food and everybody laughs, um, but that's about it. Um, so I was curious, is, is it really true? So I hit the internet and I ran across a website um, and it, on this website, it said, in the run-up to the 2020 election, headlines about political differences ripping apart families were everywhere, and there are lots of quotes. Um, but then they cited uh, data from the American National Election Study, a seven-decade-long survey about campaigns and elections, um, and it showed that narratives about family political turmoil likely have been overstated. The overwhelming majority of Americans report the political differences in their homes or families have had little real impact on their familial relationships, even if a few cases that did make the headlines. Of course, I read that and I'm always curious, right? Well, what's the bias in whoever this IFS family studies? Because just because you Google something on the internet doesn't mean it's going to be um, true or good or just. So um, in their mission statement, they say they're dedicated to strengthening marriage and family life and advancing the well-being of children through research and publication and education. Addressing family life is what we do, and we invite you to learn more about ways to strengthen families in America. That's the extent of my knowledge of this website. So then I went and said, well, wh what's really going on? Where are you coming from is one of the things that I asked. So that led me to another website called Media Bias Fact Check. Um, and I fact-checked MSNBC and Fox News, Wall Street Journal, and uh, New York Times, as well as this website. And, you know, it was pretty accurate. It was pretty interesting. So uh, apparently uh, this crowd is uh, not way right, but sort of somewhat right. Where are you coming from? What are your biases? Um, that's one of the things that I look at. So our resource. Learning to Disagree seeks to help people disagree better. Uh, we are not very good at disagreement. We view our adversaries not only as wrong, but increasingly evil. We resist notions of forgiveness, and we distrust institutions that try to mediate our disagreements. So you might be mistrusting me right now, mediating our disagreements. Um, but we'll use this book as a way of thinking about division and we can learn to disagree in a holier way. As I said, I'll blend in reflection from scripture and from our liturgical experience, showing you all that all of the tools that you need to disagree, really you're been, you've been practicing and hearing about uh, for many years. Um, the book's flow, well, the book takes a uh, sort of a law school year, right? And so he goes through his whole year, sort of a diary, of how he experiences uh, disagreement, and it's it's a it's it's a he uses stories from the past and and from the year itself. Um, so in August is where he he titles his first chapter, and he talks about how do we learn empathy. Then in September, can we know what's fair? October, what happens when we can't compromise, and so on and so forth. And so we'll take uh, two of those issues each Sunday and sort of get into them. Um, about the author, remember, always curious, whenever I read anything, what is this person's experience? What is their bias? Um, how is that going to inform me as I read and digest? Um, he's a law professor. Um, his 
scholarship focuses on the First Amendment, freedoms of speech, assembly, and religion. Um, he's written a couple of books. He's spoken here already at this church, and he's going to speak again in January. Um, he was a good law student. He clerked for a U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit judge. That means he did really well. Um, he was the Associate General Counsel for the Department of the Air Force at the Pentagon, so he's a vet. So some of those things influence the way um, he might um, present. So his first chapter is empathy. And he begins with the case of, hold on, my voice is poor. See the thing at the top? I have to wait for that to go away. Dudley and Stevens. Uh, it involved two, so he's using a legal case in law school. And this case involved two shipwrecked sailors, Dudley and Stevens, who along with another man named Brooks were stranded at sea without provisions. Has anyone ever studied this case? Me neither. I didn't do that in Louisiana. Um, so Dudley and Stevens, facing starvation, kill and eat Brooks who was the weakest among them. They were later rescued and charged with murder. The court found them guilty, ruling that necessity does not justify the killing of an innocent person, even in dire circumstances. So um, our author used this case to test the limits of empathy. What would you do were you in Dudley and Stephen's shoes? And he, he goes into a, a, a sort of a Socratic method of that. And he ends by writing, rather than launch into an immediate critique of how someone else handled an unfamiliar or impossible situation, we might pause to imagine the distance that divides our experiences. Right, so just in our, um, uh, in your reaction to that fact pattern, it was an immediate gasp oh my gosh, how could anyone ever do that? All right, so what are the distances and, and divisions in our experience here in this moment with what they were experiencing in the South Seas in a boat with waves crashing around them, starving, no water? We have a cup of coffee. We have air conditioner. If we're fat and happy, most of us. Um, how do you realize that you have a division in your experience um, and in, in, in your views and put yourself in someone else's shoes? Um, and this can be done in, I, I love that he, he uses this exaggerated case, right? Um, because it, do, it is so stark. Um, but imagine the, the, the little, little disagreements you get in or the little differences that you get into um, every week. So um, one of my favorites from church lore is, um, so imagine you're sitting in Trinity by the Cove um, and you're enjoying the beautiful prelude um, and church is about to start and all of a sudden um, a, a, young, a young woman comes in and you know, she, she may be wearing a strapless, you know, thing. Her tan line is showing. It looks like she barely got ready. Uh, and, and you have to scoot over for her, right? So in your mind, not in your mind, because you all would never do this. In some people's mind, it is, what is this person doing? Irritating me in my prayer life. I'm not dressed appropriately for church. Now, empathy. So if instead you think and wonder, how and where did this person come from? And once you hear the story, a single mom had a terrible week, got fired, finally decides to turn her life around, try something new. So, you know, Saturday night, she gets to a point where, where do I go? She Googles church and Training by the Coast popped up, 9 o'clock a.m. service. She gets here. Right? See how that changes how you would treat that person. Whereas one person might be irritated that they have to move over, another person might look and say, I'm so glad you're here. Let me help you with the bulletin. So that's what the author is getting at in, um, uh, in trying to find empathy. And he says it's not rocket science. It's hearing an unfamiliar or off-putting argument, pausing to think about what's being said, and responding 
with an appropriately engaged question. Um, and that's one of my, uh, my, my ways of being, is I always, especially when something catches me off guard, um, I use the phrase, tell me more. So it, it stops me in a moment and says, okay, I don't, I'm unfamiliar with what's going on here. What is behind this? Um, what, can I, what can I learn? Active curiosity when we're disagreeing with people. Um, it's giving people the benefit of the doubt um, because you may not know what battles they're fighting. It's treating others the way you would like to be treated, right? So, um, I mean, you can think about moments in, in your life when that's happened, um, whether it's uh, disagreeing with, uh, well, let's use grandkids, for instance. How could we practice some sort of empathy in understanding uh, where our grandkids are coming from? Um, they've maybe had different educational experiences. They may have peer pressure that's going on. They may have social media pressure that's going on. What is it that you can do to put yourself in their shoes and trying to understand where they're coming from? My hunch would be that it might be that you actually have to teach that to your grandchildren to be more empathetic. Have you put yourself in my shoes? Have you put yourself in someone else's shoes? Um, that might be one of the keys to sort of helping your family through that is it's not the issue itself it's how can we disagree how can we have empathy for one another um, jumping out of the book into the Bible um, we kind of know th this rule right um, in the Bible the golden rule is found in Matthew and in Luke and it's as stated as in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. Now, in disagreements, do you want to be heard? Do you want people to see where you're coming from? Right? Yes. And so, can you practice that with somebody else? Um, we experience this not just in Scripture, but in our worship and in our life as Christians in our baptismal vows. So you all have, I know you've been to a baptism, and you have always renewed these vows every time we have a baptism, and everybody says, will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And you say, with God's help, right? So as Christians, one of the things that we can think about as we disagree is we can have our prejudices and we can have our firm opinions and we can think we know what is right. And you know what, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. If, if we weren't thinking people, we wouldn't have ideas about right and wrong, this and that. Um, but in disagreeing with people and with being with other people, um, especially those where the temperature gets really hot, right? Um, we need to remember that it's not just our, our own work, our own will. Uh, we need to remember that the Holy Spirit is at work within us and calling us to be more loving people, right? So empathy in practice, going back to the book. Um, he's, a, he's a First Amendment guy, so um, one of the things he says in class is don't be a First Amendment hero. Um, don't be afraid to express your honest opinions, but don't treat other, but, but treat others kindly. Every time you choose to interact with someone in a way that neither downplays your own beliefs nor raises their hackles, you have made a small step toward building a kinder and gentler world. Um, so, when he's, when he's talking about free speech, we do. We have the right to say whatever we want. Does that make it good and holy to say it, right? And we had that from James this morning. Did you all hear that reading, and were you reminded to hold your tongue? And how much damage words can do. Um, they, a small fire can start a forest fire, right? Um, and that goes on to uh, one, of the, one of the, in our day and age, I think one of the hardest things that people enter into is gossip. Right? Talking about somebody who is not in the room. Don't do that. Um, instead, invite the person into the room. Right? So I was in a discussion with a bunch of clergy. 
and they were all talking about what a bishop believed. Um, and I said, well, we could settle this by just inviting the bishop to come have lunch with us. Why don't we do that instead of gossiping about what we think the person believes? Um, so, you know, in, you, in your relationships, uh, family, um, just because you can say something doesn't mean you should. Does anyone have any examples they want to share about that? No. <laughs> no, because it makes us look bad. When we say stupid, mean things, um, we, you know, we typically have uh, remorse about that. Hopefully, we do. Um, and that's another one of the neat things in our liturgy is we have the general confession, right? So it, the liturgy, when we come to worship, it's constantly reminding us, yeah, we don't always get it right, um, but we can, we, can keep on, we can keep on trying, right? We're a work in progress. Um, and let's talk about Jesus for an instant. I mean, he was forthright person, right? So First Amendment, he called people hypocrites, right? So in the New Testament, Jesus often called people hypocrites and vipers to criticize their insincerity and moral corruption. In Matthew 23, he condemned the Pharisees for their outward displays of piety, by failing to practice true righteousness. The term vipers was used to emphasize their deceitful and harmful nature, contrasting sharply with the genuine integrity he sought in his followers. There are moments when we disagree with another person, uh, when we need to speak honestly about how we feel. Hopefully, we've thought through that in a very conscientious way. Um, hopefully, we've also brought in other people to advise us, and we haven't done it sort of in the heat of the moment. Um, so if I have a really hard, um, hard decision or a hard conversation I have to have with somebody, um, I don't just give it a whirl, <laughs> right? I sit down, I pray. Um, and then, if it's appropriate, and sometimes it is, I call other people to help. Kim. I need, I need your insight here. Am I seeing this right, or have I missed something? Um, and then it can all, all, always get to the senior warden sometimes, too. If, they, if that's a conversation, wow. But it's, you know, I, 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 I need a little help. Um, what do you think about this? What, what should I do? How should I handle this? Um, and I think that's very holy in a lot of what we do in ministry in the church is, um, you know, the disciples went out two by two. Um, and so having another person to be a check, um, to, to give counsel, and to s slow you down. You know, some of the worst, I think, fights that people get into are um, just that moment of emotional um, distress that lets you blurt out something that you wish you could take back. Um, of course, the flip side of that is being silent and not speaking your mind over years, right? Which can lead into, into hardship as well. So Jesus did call people out on the carpet. I mean, he was blunt and honest, um, but Jesus was Jesus, right? I'm not Jesus, so be careful. Um, but there was the kinder Jesus, right? So yes, he called people hypocrites, but he also used all of those parables um, to engage with people in more nuanced ways, um, so, um, grandparents, Polly gave me the topic, so it's just in my head. Um, remembering stories from your childhood, um, remembering your grandparents' stories from their childhood, uh, those are ways to hopefully help um, your grandchildren see, be empathetic to you, understand where you might be coming from, in ways that don't involve, you need to watch MSNBC, you need to watch Fox News, and you will be told the truth, right? What about if instead you had a story about the Vietnam War um, and what it was like there for you um, and how you experienced government and elections and the civil rights movement, something that they haven't necessarily experienced? Um, so those are some of the stories that might be a kinder, gentler way um, to, to get into um, discussion. In, in our liturgy, um, the, you all know what the salutation is. When I say, the Lord be with you, you all say, and also with you. So it's a liturgical dialogue of mutual greeting. This comes from the Episcopal Dictionary. 
The Lord be with you and also with you. The salutation calls the people back to attention and adds emphasis to important moments in the liturgy. The dialogue of greeting and response is based on what? The book of Ruth. Boaz is greeting to the reapers and their answer. At the Holy Eucharist, a salutation precedes the collect, uh, the collect of the day at the beginning of the Liturgy of the Word. So Boaz greeted the reapers as a sign of respect and kindness, reflecting his role as a generous and responsible landowner. The reapers were the laborers working in Boaz's fields, harvesting the grain. By acknowledging them warmly, Boaz dem demonstrated his good leadership and concern for his workers, which is highlighted in the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. So for us, we have Jesus, we have uh, how he used parables, how you can use stories, but every single time you come to church, you practice saluta salutation, a greeting of warmth um, and care and kindness. So in your dialogue and in your relationships, you know, what are those moments where you can begin a conversation with care and, and kindness, right? For family members, you know, often that's, you know, when someone comes over to dinner, it's a big hug, right? Um, other things it could be is a, a pattern. So every Sunday night, Sunday supper, we talk about the sermon. Was it good, bad, ugly? What could dad have done better, right? Did dad cry this Sunday? Um, but you, ha you can set those types of um, patterns in place in your family life and in your friendship life um, to uh, get into topics that might be uncomfortable. Um, and some of you all do this. I mean, you, you've heard of sort of book clubs and discussion groups that get together and talk about different topics. Um, think about AA, a group that gets together and helps one another and talks about alcoholism, right? So you can find um, different group settings to sort of set the stage um, of, of, a, of, a, of a nice and good Um, conversation or disagreement. So the next chapter he talks about is fairness. Um, speaking in a law school class, um, so he, he governs, how many of you all lawyers? Yeah, one, oh, only one. Uh, well, you all have all been in a class, right? And normally in a, in a class, whether it's a school class or there's someone who always raises their hand every single time every single time, and hogs the whole conversation. So uh, in law school, it can be particularly egregious, I do think. So, so the, the professor is saying, our author is saying, in speaking in law school class, talk more in smaller classes, talk less in larger ones. Um, yes, you may be paying a lot of money and spending a lot of time to be in law school, but guess what? So is everybody else. The class doesn't exist for you, the one person. It exists for a larger group. Um, so law school has fact patterns um, that are used to think about the application of law. Um, and one of the author's hardest examples has to do with killing. So Jennifer was arrested for drunk driving in rural Minnesota. She and her husband had been drinking with friends at a remote lake cabin when he began beating her on the head. At two in the morning, she, um, she went to her car and he chased after her. Once she was in the car, he pounded on the windshield so hard it began to shatter. She didn't have a phone because he took it away. So she drove away to find safety. Now, is that drunk driving the same as someone driving home after a party? Yes, it is. So what if Jennifer had struck and killed someone? What if she'd driven through a crowded sidewalk but managed to hurt no one? When we ask these questions, we find our intuitions about fairness reflect not only Jennifer's actions, but also her motives, the risk created, and the actual harm caused. So what the author is getting at is these tensions and ambiguities highlight the uncomfortable reality that while law is useful and necessary social tool, it cannot answer all our questions about fairness. Um, he also talks about fairness in speeding tickets. So he has a story, he's a lawyer, and I experienced this when I went to go contest a speeding ticket too. You go in, you're in a suit, you sit down in front of the pro prosecutor, 
um, the prosecutor asks you questions and you know how to answer them, right? Now the people before and after you are not in a suit. They're in blue jeans and a t-shirt. They've never been in front of a prosecutor. They don't know what's going on. Um, is that fair? Is that fair? Um, so, you know, these questions about fairness. Um, he ends the chapter, it's interesting, he, he gets into a dispute. I mean, they don't come to a settlement with the, all the law school professors engaging in this, but he says, procedures and rules won't answer our hardest questions about fairness, nor can we resolve questions of fairness through appeals to intuition. When we are left to our own devices, our sense of fairness emerges out of our own stories and experiences. More of us tend to think of our intuition as right more often than not. So if we brought scripture into here, and I think you could go into a lot of different directions, thinking about fairness, thinking about judgment, thinking about sin, um, and we can just leave that in tension. What I'd rather do is uh, go into, and we use the Beatitudes as part of one of our waterfront worship survey, uh, services. I think we do it in, in Epiphany. Um, and it is, uh, I meant to put it on the slide so you all could read it for me, with me, but I didn't do that. So the celebrant will say, let us hear our Lord's blessings on those who follow him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to these in terms of, is this fair? Is this fair? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who suffer persecution for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So is it fair that people are persecuted for their faith? Um, is it fair that some people will lay down their life for another? Um, is it fair that the hungry get to go first? Is it fair that those who mourn will be comforted? Is it fair that people who are poor in spirit inherit the kingdom of heaven? Sort of God's, a lens from God's view on what's fair and how that sort of shakes out. Um, so, you know, for us um, in our disagreements, um, getting into disagreements, what's fair, what's not, how is the world shaping out, um, being mindful of our own intuition and experiences, um, and knowing that those can be flawed, um, practicing that empathy um, and trying to see where someone else is coming from. And, and I think for us as Christians, um, trying to live into what theologians call God's economy, right? How does God really view the world? How are we supposed to see the world through that lens? Um, and that's what you all are doing in church Sunday by Sunday, uh, what they're doing in Faith Seeking Journey. That's the practice of a lifetime growing in holiness um, so that uh, when we meet Jesus, we can say, I was a peacemaker right? in, all, in, in all my relationships, or um, I actually comforted people um, rather than deriding them, rather than laughing at them. Um, you know, I, I did go without so others could have. Um, those are some of the, the fairness questions that I think uh, we can get through God's lens. So don't forget, you can always have a cup of coffee with me to talk about this more deeply. Um, but in the meantime, questions or comments? Any, any thoughts? Did I cover the grandparent thing kind of, sort of? Again, there's no answer because it's really you and your stories and your way of being um, and your practice and your growth um, in disagreeing with others and hopefully helping them to see where you're coming from. I talked about myself. But I still have, you know, you read that there are plenty of churches where they take the Bible and they just take it and they don't have to worry about it. And based on what you're saying, Christians should not be doing that. Um, no, I wouldn't say Christians wouldn't be doing that. I'm using the me. I won't do that. 
Um, but I have a, uh, I have a, I have a ministry that is different um, than some other people. So in New Orleans, in a lot of the African American churches, politics is very much in, in, in what they engage in. I mean, they talk about it. It's part of their, it's part of their Sunday routine. Um, some Episcopal churches, um, they dance really close to that 501c3 line, um, getting up in the pulpit and talking about the evils of Donald Trump. Um, and the other side in the pulpit when they talk about the evils of the Democrat Party, right? Um, here, I acknowledge and cherish that you all are wonderful thinking people. And you're going to make up your own decisions about politics. And you don't want me talking about that from a pulpit. Now, if you want to have a cup of coffee and talk about it there where it's equal, give and take, um, I'll absolutely do that with you. Although, again, know that I'm not going to lead on, really, um, where I am on most issues. And usually I'll duck and weave and make you think I think something that I might not think. Because... My, again, my job isn't to tell you um, and, and, and to say this is what I think about public life. It is, I want to be there at your hospital bed as your priest when you need someone to pray with you. All right. Yes. Um, so the question, I'm remembering that they're uh, streamers. The question is, is making a family rule of avoiding, intentionally avoiding politics all right? Um, so let's engage in what we just went through, which is let's practice some em empathy, right? So I don't know uh, how every single family engages in politics. You might have uh, a daughter-in-law who has uh, married into the family, who is completely different in her worldview than, than, than you are, right? And there is nothing that's going to resolve that, at least overnight, right? It, it can take years for relationships to develop and grow so the trust can be there, so you can, you know, talk and engage and disagree and love. Um, so it might be good in that instance to have a rule that, hey, let's keep this off limits. Let's develop our relationship in other ways with other shared experiences before we, uh, before we engage in politics. Um, so pastorally, though, so I have a great deal of respect for the wisdom of the ages. The communion of saints, that's the church, you know, church triumphant. All the saints who I, uh, I know and are praying for us, but that goes for grandmothers, great-grandparents, um, all those lines who have experienced uh, hurts and healing. Um, and if you don't share that with the generations below, they're going to miss out. Um, so that's where can you share them in a way like, like that Jesus, forthright versus parables right? So can you share some of those experiences in a parable way um, that might talk about politics, um, but it might be um, talking about, so one of the examples that I have was my grandmother would talk about the time when Huey Long was shot and, and killed. And in my family, there was a huge divide between those who liked Huey Long and those who didn't. Um, I mean, it was severe, and it was a very scary time in Louisiana history. Um, and half the family was excited because they were so scared. And the other half was, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe this has happened. Um, so now that story has been told to me, you know, since childhood. And so bring that and imagine my uh, response to the world around us right now. Um, and presidential assassination attempts. So without, you know, that wisdom from grandparents and the generations before, my experience of the present day wouldn't have been as rich and as nuanced. I think there was another one. Barb. Yeah. 
Yeah, Barb is saying how important I statements are, right? Um, making sure that you're sort of claiming your own space and, and respecting the dignity of someone else. I've read the whole book once through, and now I'm reading each two chapters each week again. So I can't remember if he said that, but if he didn't, we've just said it now. It's really important to use I statements when, you, when you're disagreeing and to sort of own your own space and acknowledge that there's someone else there who, who really might disagree with you. And going back to that baptismal vow, respect the dignity of everybody around you, and how do you, how do you really do that? That is our time. One last question. Right, so, you know, that's where um, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, has a unique role in the world. Um, and in Roman Catholic piety, people listen to him more than they'll listen to an Episcopal priest. I mean, Episcopal priests and Episcopal bishops, people kind of don't, you know, they don't always listen to us, right? So the, when the Pope says something, the Roman Catholics really got to tune in. Um, and that's one of the challenges that Roman Catholics have, uh, have about it. Um, I'd, give you, I'd give you another story of another election that I've been through, which is David Duke and Edwin Edwards in Louisiana. David Duke, a KKK member, Edwin Edwards, a known corrupt politician crook. So there were bumper stickers that said, vote for the crook, it's important. <laughs> right? Um, now, the flip side of that, and this is getting into, you know, the lesser of two evils, um, when Edwin Edwards was elected, he could wheel and deal, and he did, and gambling came to Louisiana. And there were people who thought gambling would be terrible for us. And so, two years later, they looked at their vote for Edwin Edwards, and they said, had I voted for David Duke, he wouldn't have gotten anything accomplished, because everyone would have looked at him as a racist and said, we're not going along with you. Um, but now that's a sort of a political hindsight, and that is, you know, when we, when we vote and we gauge in public life, it's, it's, it's a political fo force. I mean, we get, he has that in a, in a chapter in a little bit. Um, you got to vote. You got to vote your conscience. All right. All right, let me go get ready for church. Don't forget, if you do want to read along, the bookmark is right up there, and it has prayers on the back.